Welcome to our Conversations with Changemakers. I'm Elizabeth Filippouli, the founder of Global Thinkers Forum, a London-based non-profit organization that promotes accountability in leadership. Over the years, we have built a diverse network of social impact thought leaders with whom we share a common vision to promote values-based thinking. The forum was incubated at Oxford University's Said Business School in 2011. In this series, we interview change makers from different parts of the world. We want to hear how they are living through the coronavirus crisis as professionals and as individuals. We invite them to share their insights and forecasting for the day after. Today, I'm interviewing Michelle Booker. Michelle is an American author, commentator, and policy analyst specializing in the world economy and crisis anticipation. She has authored three books, among them the international bestseller, The Grey Rhino, How to Recognize and Act on the Obvious Dangers We Ignore. Michelle introduced the Grey Rhino concept at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2013 and developed it into a best-selling book that was published in 2016. Michelle, welcome to our Conversations with Changemakers. Thank you so much for inviting me. So what exactly is the Grey Rhino concept? I would love to hear it from you. So the Grey Rhino is a metaphor for the big two-ton thing that's coming at you. It's got its horn pointed your way, it's snorting, it's pawing the ground, uh, it's getting ready to charge. In some cases, it's already charging. And I created it as a way to draw attention to the very human vulnerability that we're all too likely to take our eyes off the ball and get trampled by the very obvious things right in front of us. It's a challenge both to the elephant in the room, the thing that by definition nobody says or does anything about, which I don't think is okay. The gray rhino is something that people are talking about and, and a very prescient few are doing something about. But it's also a challenge to the black swan, the metaphor that came out of the 2008 financial crisis for the thing that's so improbable and unforeseeable that you can't possibly see it coming ahead of time and you can only see it in hindsight. And it was intended as a way to get us to broaden our imaginations to picture the possibility that something unimaginable could trample us and to become more resilient. But instead, policymakers and investors used it as a cop-out, as an excuse uh, for saying, oh, nobody could have seen that coming, when in many cases, particularly in parts of the 2008 crisis, like the subprime mortgage crisis, many people did see it coming. Many people did say something and nothing happened. And uh, a gray rhino is really a way to connect people emotionally. I looked at all of this attention going to the black swan, which you know, is, is a nice thing to say to make yourself sound smart, but is not actually very useful in the end, particularly the, the, the way it's been adopted. And to get people to take that energy and that emotional engagement and focus it on things that we could do something about. So rhino, because it's big and scary, and gray, because interestingly, there are five rhino species. One of them is black and one of them is white, but neither one of them are actually those colors. They're all gray. So it's really a metaphor for the obvious things that we don't call by their name at the, that we don't recognize. So that's why it's gray. And so when you observed a uh, phenomena before the 2008 crisis, which were those cases, those incidents that you felt were reminiscent or were pointing more towards the gray rhino concept? Well, every year, uh, this was my fifth year, I do a roundup of all the top lists and predictions and outlooks and forecast lists uh, around the world to try to get a sense of what is keeping people up at night, particularly the people whose job it is to think about these sort of things. They change a little bit from year to year, um, but the past couple of years, particularly financial fragilities have been huge, uh, particularly the way that uh, uh, the loose monetary policy after 2008 created huge asset bubbles that were just getting ready to pop. As we've, we've now seen, the coronavirus is 
what made them pop. Climate change is another very big one and uh, global inequality. And these three interact with each other. Over the past year, a lot of central banks and, uh, and even uh, investors have pointed out that uh, insurance companies are way undercapitalized uh, when compared to the predictions for what climate change is going to be doing. And that has the potential to bring down the whole financial system with it. Um, the financial fragilities, this, this huge asset bubble, has increased social and economic inequality around the world, which in turn has fed into a lot of the, the political discontent and dis disruptions, which actually is another one that's consistently been on the, the top five on this list. And climate change also is related to inequality because of course the people who contribute least to climate change are the ones who are most vulnerable to it. Um, so pandemics is a very interesting thing. Um, it hasn't shown up a lot on these lists, although it was in the, in the top 10 list of the World Economic Forum Global Risks Report this year. Uh, but business continuity issues have been big for quite some time. You know, businesses are very worried about disruptions. And there have been so many warnings about coming pandemics. A very important speech that uh, Bill Gates gave uh, a few years back. Uh, there was a scenario, several scenario planning exercises actually done last year, including uh, under the Trump administration. Johns Hopkins University has done a lot on this. Many, many people thinking and warning and saying, hey, we're not ready for this. We need to do more about it. And of course, you've probably read the news stories about the United States uh, having repeatedly cut the budget for the Centers for Disease Control, specifically for pandemic uh, preparedness and for the, the World Health Organization. And so although it wasn't necessarily the top on everybody's list, uh, we've seen so many pandemics over the years. In fact, my own great-grandfather died in the second wave of the great flu epidemic of 1918. Uh, and uh, when my mother was pregnant with me, they had the, the Hong Kong flu. So these things happen every so often, and uh, we get warnings, and we know this is repeated. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. Uh, it's likely to be worse in the future. But Many people warned and many people ignored it. And that's what's gotten us into the situation we're in today. But what are the ways that we could have protected ourselves against something so huge, so massive and so out of control? Well, the, uh, the you know, public health experts have, uh, have done a lot on this, certainly preparedness uh, warning systems. But I think some of it really has to do with a mentality uh, as much as specific policy steps. You've seen so many ignored warnings in the United States, you know, particularly in January with all these behind uh, closed door briefings uh, where policymakers were told, hey, this is, this is going to be a, a big one. Uh, you've got people who, who've been in some of these meetings who have said that, um, that Donald Trump didn't want to do testing uh, because he was worried about how it would look politically. Uh, you had senators who came out and told their constituents that, oh, we're, we're going to be fine. And then they went and they, they dumped a bunch of stocks that they thought would be vulnerable and bought stocks like telemedicine, teleworking stocks. So there were people who saw those warnings and just didn't have the mentality, the sense of urgency to do something about it. Um, some very specific things are, you know, certainly, you know, testing, uh, having a supply of masks, medical grade masks on hand, being much quicker to close schools and to start social distancing. And even more recently, uh, my friend Jeremy Howard has a wonderful initiative called Masks for All, for with the number four, uh, looking at how countries where mask usage is common uh, have done a better job of flattening the curve and urging people to make their own masks so that there are more masks for medical professionals. And you know, that's been catching on as, as well. And of course, all of these reports and scenario plannings have much more detailed recommendations than, uh, than we have time to go in, into today. But all those plans were right there and the people who could have paid attention to them didn't. Michelle, over a year ago, the Chinese president made a rare acknowledgement of the serious risks facing the Chinese economy. 
um, and he was addressing at the time, if I'm not mistaken, hundreds of top communist party officials, and he had warned them that China must be on the alert against black swans and gray rhinos. Do you think that China was suspecting or expecting such a pandemic or, or do you think that the Chinese president was probably referring to other risks? Well, of course, this was uh, a little over a year ago, and financial fragilities have been very much on the mind of the Chinese government. And uh, I've actually been to China uh, seven times in the past few years uh, because the gray rhino really struck a chord there. Uh, you know, the central bank uh, thinks about gray rhinos. Uh, what's nice about the, the gray rhino is that it's not just something that you use to describe something. There's a framework that goes along with it that, you know, why are people not dealing with something at a particular stage of a crisis? And so China, since 2017, has actually been looking very closely uh, at gray rhino risks and using that framework. Uh, they had a, a five-year financial planning meeting in 2017 in the summer, and the gray rhino was very much part of those discussions. And at the closing of it, uh, they came out with a front page editorial in People's Daily, again, saying, watch out, not just for black swans, but also gray rhinos, and listed some of the biggest financial gray rhinos, uh, you know, shadow banking, uh, uh, potential uh, capital markets, shocks, a real estate market bubble, you know, it's a new, new internet uh, financial products that weren't properly regulated, uh, corporate debt. And they actually started taking a number of policy measures to deal with these. So in 2018, there were a bunch of articles in the U.S. press saying, oh, you know, China's real estate is slowing. Oh, what a mess. But if you actually look at the history, you see that it was actually a deliberate policy decision where the Chinese policymakers saw a bubble and they were trying to keep from making the bubble bigger before it popped in a disastrous way, which is what we're seeing with the US financial markets. It hasn't hit real estate markets yet, but it's, it's quite possible that it will. Which is something we had seen in 2008 in the Emirates, in Dubai, right? Yes, and, and all over the place. It's interesting, actually, 2008 um, was when the black swan concept really came out. And, and part of the, uh, the definition uh, that the author of that book mentioned was he said, it's something that uh, can't be foreseen, but in hindsight, people say was foreseen. But it, that's not how it's actually been used. And this is such a fantastic example of it. This is a case where so many things were foreseen and then at the beginning of this year, so many fund managers and politicians came out and tried to pretend that they weren't foreseen. They were using the black swan almost as, as a cover-up. And so even though the black swan was such a, um, an you know, iconic phrase of 2008, it's actually the misuse of the black swan. And, and frankly, that misuse was one of the reasons why I felt we needed a metaphor like the gray rhino that includes inherently in the concept a notion of accountability and i don't just want it to be used as a you know pointing backwards blame game sort of thing say you should have seen this coming other people did you didn't i mean obviously you want to hold leaders accountable um, but it's a tool for looking into the future saying what are the gray rhinos coming at us what can we do looking into the future to keep them from coming so that the next time when something happens and people say, oh, you didn't see it coming, you can say, yes, we did. Here are all the things that we did. And if we hadn't done them, it would have been a thousand times worse. That's really the way that I hope the concept is uh, continued to be adapted. Well, your concept is brilliant. I, I just can't help to wonder, what is it that keeps our leaders or our societies uh, from acting. So is it negligence? Is it a form of inertia? Is it, I don't know, lack of funding or uh, fear of change? What is it that keeps us from preventing such disasters? It's such a good question and obviously one that I've spent a lot of time on and I'm doing research now uh, for my next book on uh, much more the psychological part of that. Um, the Gray Rhino, the first book, does talk about the psychological parts of it. There are lots of cognitive biases that lead humans to look away from what we don't want to see, 
There's research that shows that we absorb information that is aligned with what we want to think or that is what we want to hear. And we're less likely to absorb information that we don't want to hear. Um, so it's like this, this little tiny um, devil inside of our heads putting, clapping its hands over our ears. So there, there are definitely psychological and decision-making parts of it that once you're aware of, uh, you're much better positioned to combat. But another big part of it has to do with the incentives that we create uh, within organizations, in financial markets, in political systems. Uh, the Western political system obviously uh, rewards short-term behavior over long-term. Uh, so do markets with their emphasis on quarterly earnings. Uh, there have been many, many economic thinkers coming out and saying, hey, the majority of a business's value is long-term and some of these very short-term decisions that businesses make are actually destroying long-term value for the short-term benefit of the noisiest shareholders. Um, so I think we really need to, to rethink our incentives, how decisions are made. The American political system in particular rewards people on the, on the outer edges of the spectrum on either side. Uh, there are lots of movements like, like ranked choice voting, uh, other things that help to, to uh, help candidates uh, who are more likely to be more practical and move ahead with, with some of the preventative measures that more of the population is interested in. Um, I think also budgeting uh, is a big part of it. You know, I think that there are some very long-term issues that should be taken away from this short-term political process. You know, put a big chunk of funds in the hands of technocrats with responsibility and accountability for dealing with longer term problems. Because right now, the way the political system is set up, it rewards politicians who, uh, you know, who kick the can down the road to the next person. And to be honest, that also helps the person who takes over because we reward people for cleaning up messes and we don't reward them for preventing messes in the first place. So I think we also need a lot better mechanism for recognizing people who make those difficult decisions. Well, right now it feels as if we are lost in the heart of a jungle. Uh, we don't know when this crisis will end. We don't know uh, what the duration of the lockdown measures is going to be and how national economies will be affected and of course how the global economy will be affected and if we're all going to enter a meltdown, which if the lockdown continues, uh, I think it may be inevitable. So uh, I guess my next question to you is, which direction do you see the next gray rhino coming from? Well, I think we have a lot of gray rhinos that are uh, the offspring of, of the crisis that we're in. <laughs> sound very optimistic. They're, uh, they're babies, but they're big babies. I actually, as part of my research, I went and met a quote unquote baby rhino at the Lincoln Park Zoo who, who was, you know, already 1600 pounds. So even baby rhinos are pretty darn big. Um, but, but some of these are really, um, you might say gray rhinos that had been hiding in the bush uh, and that this crisis is sort of like a, a brush fire that all of a sudden, you know, revealed them. I mean, a lot of the the tensions over economic inequality really have come to the forefront. Uh, there was a Federal Reserve study uh, fairly recently saying that 40% uh, of Americans would struggle to meet a $400 emergency expense. And, you know, being out of work for weeks and weeks and months and months is way bigger than a $400 expense. And we're seeing now that the system was just not set up to do that. Or you look at healthcare, a system where employers are the biggest provider of healthcare. All these people have now lost their jobs, and you know, that's not looking like a, a great way to provide a social safety net anymore. Uh, so the you know the, the gray rhinos that are appearing are many many of them were there all along, and maybe you know, they're not so much babies. It's just they've they've gotten a, a bunch of food. They've gotten much bigger <laughs> really fast. Um, mm -hmm. But I think we're really going to need to look at these, uh, you know, these long-term issues about how we provide for this for society. And what's interesting is that that 
the last crisis, the, the quote unquote solution to the last crisis was to throw a lot of money at people who already had money, uh, you know, to, to, to pump up this bubble in the stock market. And people have been saying that this is not trickling down. Uh, there have been some estimates, some very, very smart people on Wall Street I've spoken with uh, talking about between 75% and more than 90% of the money printing that went on after 2008 uh, went straight into the stock market, into speculation, and not into the real economy. But you see now that it's very clear that when a lot of the most vulnerable people all of a sudden can't spend money, all of a sudden the people in power say, okay, it's, it's okay to, to give them money. And that sort of thinking should have been happening all along, that uh, you know, people need to be able to spend, people need to be able to support themselves, and if that's not the center of policy efforts, then even your efforts to, to build up a bubble in the markets are going to collapse as well. Because the reason people buy shares is either that, you know, that the price is going to go up or that they're going to get dividends, a share of the company's earnings. But at some point, if the companies don't have the economic activity behind them to produce those earnings, no amount of economic stimulus is going to keep that stock market going. And we're starting to see that. And a lot of people are seeing that we haven't hit the bottom by a long shot, that there's going to be a lot more weakness in markets. Uh, but you still see the Federal Reserve talking about buying corporate bonds, buying into the secondary market. We've seen a little bit of helicopter money, but I think there, there needs to be a lot more longer term thinking about how to keep the economy alive, and also how to do it in a much greener and cleaner way. Absolutely. And I think if there was ever a moment for the private sector to demonstrate accountability, this is now, because the burden that is falling on individual governments' uh, shoulders is massive. It is enormous, and they will not be able to hold it up alone. They will need money from the private sector. And this is what our societies are going to need to survive. But of course, as we know, there are tremendous opportunities in every crisis, Michelle. So I would like to hear from you and perhaps kind of, you know, end this conversation uh, in a more positive tone. What are some interesting opportunities that will emerge from this frustrating reality? One of the big things for me has to do with this question of a, a sense of human agency. Uh, which is a term that I've been seeing so much more in the media the past few years. And in fact, I knew it was really big when I saw Gwyneth Paltrow quoted in the New York Times magazine talking about a sense of human agency. The last person you would, would have thought. But you know, for so long, climate change and other of these issues seem so big that people said, hey, just as one person, what can I possibly do? I can't possibly make a difference. And the biggest thing that's becoming clear out of this public health emergency is that one person's behavior makes a huge difference and that we need a lot of one person decisions you know, to stay home, to wear a mask, to wash your hands, uh, to look out for your neighbors, is that it really does depend on every single person. And I'm hoping that that, uh, that realization can carry on once we're out of this and we can apply it to things like climate change, that uh, we can apply it to things like, like community building, like a shared sense of responsibility for our communities, for our countries, uh, for our planet. This realizing how interdependent, how interconnected we are. We are all in it together and that what each single person does makes a big difference. So if each one of us is out there spotting gray rhinos, asking ourselves what we're doing about them, and then what could we be doing better? Who do we need on our side? How do we get them on our side? How are we all working together to look at what could be a, a very big danger and use that power as a way to move ourselves forward? That's really what I'm hoping comes out of this and that people move on from this, this fatalistic, passive black swan nonsense, adopt this gray rhino mentality and start looking ahead 
and doing something about the big scary things that are coming right at us. And perhaps something else will be to also discover or rediscover the value of human relationships and turn our eyes, our attention and our hearts more into building such relationships because uh, in the heart of a crisis, what you really find as the only, if you like, uh, comforting moment is when you speak to people who are close to you or you feel affiliated with to create a better world like I hope we are trying to do through this conversation Michelle and I would really like to thank you for your time and also for your incredible work. Thank you and you're one of the people I've uh, reconnected with after too long so uh, that, that's been happening so many times over and over again and uh, I'm very very happy uh, that that's that's uh, that's happened with us and hopefully with with all of the people in all of your listeners lives and that uh, we will use this moment uh, to to build that community going forward and i'm sure that we will have more opportunities to uh, have uh, conversations in the future thank you for listening to the global thinkers forums podcast conversations with change makers follow us on social media on global thinkers f and you can email us on info at globalthinkersforum.org. We invite you to explore our work and join our incredible network of people who want to actively do something positive for our world. Keep well, keep safe. <laughs>